Hey geeks, now that life has returned to our normal programming, we can talk about all the craziness outside of Washington. So let's get our world on and dive in. Please hit that subscribe button, click the notification bell, follow us, and like this video. I'm telling you, Vladi Putin is getting on my last nerve. Alexei Navalny, who's Russia's key opposition leader, was arrested in Moscow this week as soon as he landed at the airport, after having been in Germany for five months where he was recovering from a poison attack. He was poisoned with a Russian nerve agent called Novichok that the Soviet Union developed during the Cold War. Of course, the Ruskies deny poisoning him, which is why President Putin was seen this week trying to wash away his sins. I actually put the Russian government on my list a few months ago for this attack, which nearly killed Alexei Navalny. He fell into a coma because of it and was airlifted to Germany to recover. And the fact that he recovered as well as he did is amazing. He knew it was likely he'd be detained when he went back, but he insisted on going home because he said that staying in Europe in exile would only be a gift to Putin. I don't want to see Navalny behind bars, but he's right. He's a genuine thorn in Putin's side, and he poses a much greater threat to the Russian government if he's inside Russia's borders. Even in prison, Navalny knows how to push Vladi's buttons. On his second day there, Navalny released a massive investigation on an enormous, and may I add tacky, and secret castle Putin allegedly built along with the financial corruption scheme Putin used to help build it. Leaders around the world have called for Navalny's release. And so the question is, together, can world leaders put enough pressure to get him out? The fact is the Russian government has never really been swayed by these calls and they brazenly detain or kill dissidents. When the Russian foreign minister was asked whether he was worried this story would damage rep Russia's reputation, he said that Russia wasn't a lady waiting to come out at a ball. It's an interesting comparison. The Biden administration will pursue a tougher approach toward Russia, particularly by working with our allies to pressure the Russian government to stop its bad behavior. But the truth is, it's going to be tough. The Russian government has been behaving like one big spoiler and practically mopping the floor with everyone, whether it's hacking the US government, interfering in our elections, meddling in Syria, Libya, or Ukraine. And unfortunately, they've behaved badly with little consequence. If we really want to move the needle on Russia, then we have to work with numerous international partners to impose sanctions together and make sure that Russia's playboys aren't allowed to stash their cash in London, Switzerland, or elsewhere. Ultimately though, Navalny's ability to organize people in protests and to expose the massive corruption of President Putin and his inner circle are what will bring change to Russia. On Secretary Pompeo's last full day in office, he made a remarkable move that was celebrated by many human rights activists. And yet cable news networks barely covered it, if at all. That's all right, I know that's why you obviously watch Oh My World. He declared that the Chinese government is committing genocide and crimes against humanity for its abuse of the Muslim Uyghur minority based in the northwestern part of China, in an area called Xinjiang. This is a big deal, and it's a great move for a lot of reasons, but it needs some real serious follow-up. The fact of the matter is that what the Chinese government is committing against its minority is genocide, and reports coming out of China of the sheer abuse the government is engaged in against this population have been horrific. Two million Uyghurs have been imprisoned in so-called re-education camps, where they are tortured, physically and sexually abused, forced to become infertile, and brainwashed with propaganda. One former Uyghur prisoner recently shared her harrowing story, where she explained that after living in France for 10 years, she was called back to China to sign some retirement papers and was then locked up for two years. She says she was systematically dehumanized, humiliated, and brainwashed, with the ultimate purpose of erasing Uyghur identity and culture. The definition of genocide is the deliberate killing of a large number of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the aim of destroying that nation or group. So with activity that's so obviously criminal, you'd wonder why throughout our history it's been so difficult to declare genocide when it takes place. Well, one of the main reasons for that is because according to international law, declaring genocide obligates you to prevent these crimes and punish the perpetrators. So listen, I think it's awesome that the Trump administration went out and declared this for what it is. First, because it gives the Uyghurs international global recognition of what's going on, and that helps them get the world to pressure China to stop. And by the way, China cares about this declaration, demonstrated by the fact that they responded angrily by sanctioning 28 Trump administration officials, including Secretary Pompeo. Second, because governments should call out genocide when they see it, period. The International Criminal Court, for example, which exists to investigate horrific crimes like this, decided to not even investigate China's abuse because they're afraid to confront China. But the third reason this move is so important, and this is what I want to hone in on, is because it underscores our responsibility to protect innocents from these crimes. The Trump administration did this on their last full day in office. And so the annoying part with that is that you can't just go declare genocide and drop the mic. It doesn't work like that. If you were going to declare genocide, then why did you wait until the day before you left? You have to follow up. Luckily, the Biden team says they agree with the declaration, so I'm hopeful they'll work to help put an end to these horrific crimes. 
Uganda's President Museveni is looking like one big, insecure, and evil man-child. Uganda had presidential elections last week, and President Museveni was declared the winner, even though many claimed the election was rigged. So he did, of course, what most winners do, which is to effectively place his opponent under house arrest without placing charges. Lucky for everyone, this will be Museveni's sixth term, which means he will be Uganda's president for four decades. In the days before and after the election, Uganda's president imposed a nationwide ban on the internet and social media to prevent any kind of organizing and to control information. And before that, his security forces attacked and killed protesters at rallies, they harassed opposition candidates and campaign staff, and they suppressed the media. Museveni's opponent and leading opposition leader, Bobby Wine, is a 38-year-old legislator and also a pop star whose songs have often had a socially conscious message. He has sung about the pandemic, about government repression, and the need for change and peaceful transition of power. But he's currently stuck at his house with his wife and 18-month-old niece, where he says they've now run out of food and milk. The U.S. ambassador in Uganda actually tried to visit and check on him, but security forces prevented her from coming in or leaving food, and she's now been accused of interfering in the elections. Uganda is actually an important U.S. ally for regional security, and we give nearly $1 billion annually in security and development aid, which Bobby Wine has asked the U.S. to cut off because he says it props up the leader's brutal regime. One of the things I personally hated watching was how the Ugandan president compared his people calling for democracy to the mob that assaulted the Capitol building here. We're never going to live that down. Not for a while. The issue here is that we can't have a bunch of boomers all over the world who are so afraid to lose power that they use state authorities to repress their own people and prevent anyone else from coming to office. For that reason, Uganda's president was 70 on my shit list this week. I'm kind of excited to talk about who I'm crushing on this week, in part because I'm literally crushing on him, but also because this man is doing so much good. Oh my world, I'm like blushing right now. <laughs> and I'm also excited because I've been wanting to talk to you about food security. Chef Jose Andres is a Spanish-American chef, restaurateur, and founder of World Central Kitchen, which is a nonprofit that provides fresh meals to those hit by disasters or other crises, and they mobilize in record time. As they say, they use the power of food to heal communities and strengthen economies in times of crisis. My husband and I actually met Jose Andres at one of his restaurants in Las Vegas. He and his wife, Patricia, created this nonprofit after the devastating earthquake in Haiti in 2010. And since then, World Central Kitchen has served more than 50 million fresh meals all over the world. And their efforts to help during the pandemic have just been phenomenal. They've jumped in to help feed marginalized and vulnerable communities, as well as our health workers on the front lines. This week, Jose Andres delivered meals to thousands of our troops while they slept on the floor of our Capitol building to keep it secure in advance of the inauguration. I swear, there's a fire of some kind and he magically appears with food. He's like Spider-Man or Spider Chef. The thing I absolutely love about Chef Andres, aside from the fact that he kind of reminds me of Andy Garcia, right? No, that's just me. It's his story and what he's chosen to do with his success. He came to New York City as a young Spaniard with only $50 in his pocket. Very quickly, his talent helped him rise up the ranks and he now owns restaurants across the United States and all over the world. I love it because his story is just so American. But even better is that with all this success, he repeatedly pays it forward. He says that wherever there's a fight so hungry people may eat, he will be there. I heard him. Jose Andres and World Central Kitchen are just crushing it. To get involved or donate, please visit ohmyworld.tv. Geeks, it feels so good to talk about something not Trump related. I feel alive. I feel world abulous. Hit that subscribe button and like this video, leave me a comment or question, or give me an idea if there's a story or nonprofit or person you'd like me to talk about. And please follow Oh My World and me on Instagram and Twitter. Stay fabulous, geeks.